you will have seen a very, very brief bio in the front of the booklet that you have here. Just let me remind you that it's very appropriate that we have a curial cardinal here, cardinal here in this year of the priest. Uh, cardinal Arinze has been a priest for 52 years. He was ordained in 1958. He was made a bishop in 1965, and when he was consecrated, he was the youngest Roman Catholic bishop in the world. Uh, he has been very much associated with the inner workings at the Vatican over a number of years, and because of his undoubted ability and his willingness to serve, He's been appointed to a number of very, very important congregations and areas of responsibility that he has discharged with distinction throughout a long priestly life. He was summoned to Rome in 1984 by the late John Paul II and has served there in a distinguished capacity ever since. But prior to him leaving his homeland, and under the cause of which being those dreadful uprisings in the Nigerian Biafran Wars, he was instrumental in helping to alleviate the sufferings of persons who were affected by those dreadful wars. And one international worker described the Cardinal's efforts as the most effective and efficient distribution of relief materials in history. He has served his own people well, he has served the church well, he serves us well. Ladies and gentlemen, Francis Cardinal Arinze. May Jesus Christ be praised, now and forever. Amen. Your Excellencies, Reverend Fathers, Religious Brothers and Sisters, Dear Brothers and Sisters in Christ, Our beloved Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave us his body and blood in the ineffable sacrament and mystery of the Holy Eucharist. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Doing that, he not only gave us the Holy Eucharist, but he ordained his apostles, priests, by instructing them to do this in remembrance of me. It is therefore fitting that in this Eucharistic Convention we reflect on the sacred priesthood in the church that Jesus founded. This theme is also particularly indicated in this current year for priests. We shall begin by saying who the priest is. We know that he offers the Eucharistic sacrifice, he preaches the word of God, and he gathers the people of God together under the authority of the bishop. The priest is an announcer of the transcendent God. He keeps the people, he helps the people to be and to remain oriented towards God. He is a mediator who brings God's graces to the people, and he intercedes for them. It is therefore important that we should have priests. All of us are involved in the promotion of priestly vocations and in the support for our priests. These will now be the elements for our reflection. So to begin, identity of the priest. Who is the priest? We know, but we will do well to 
articulate it once more. Christ is the eternal high priest. By his positive decision, he chose some men in his church and conferred on them the priesthood. By the laying on of hands, the gift of the Holy Spirit is transmitted to these men so that they become empowered to continue in the church the ministry of reconciliation, of shepherding the flock of God, and of teaching. The Roman pontifical, that means the book the bishop uses to ordain priests, teaches that priests are ordained, quote, so as to serve Christ the teacher, priest, and shepherd, by whose ministry his body, that is the church, is built and grows into the people of God, a holy temple. Priests officiate and minister in the name of Christ and in the person of Christ, the head and the shepherd. The preface of the Chrism Mass, that Mass on Holy Thursday, when the bishop blesses the three types of oil, and he has his priests with him concelebrating, the preface there is an authoritative source to tell us the origin, the identity, the mission, and the demanding nature of the mission of the priest. From it, I quote, By your Holy Spirit, you anointed your only Son, High Priest of the new and eternal covenant, with wisdom and love, you have planned that this one priesthood should continue in the church. Christ gives the dignity of the royal priesthood to the people he has made his own. From these, with a brother's love, he chooses men to share his sacred ministry by the laying on of hands. He appointed them to renew in, the, in his name the sacrifice of redemption as they set before your family his paschal meal. He calls them to lead your holy people in love, nourish them by your word, and strengthen them through the sacraments. Father, they are to give their lives in your service and for the salvation of your people as they strive to grow in the likeness of Christ and honor you by their courageous witness of faith and love. So the church sings, on that Christian Mass day. And the liturgy of the church is a manifestation and an articulation of our faith. The cure of us, St. John Mary Vianney, patron of priests and of this year for priests, spoke of the priesthood as a great gift and task entrusted to a human creature and beyond our power to understand fully. He says, Oh, how great is the priest. If he realized wh what he is, he would die. God obeys him. He utters a few words, and the Lord descends from heaven at his voice. Indeed, the saintly parish priest of ours regarded himself as inadequate and unworthy, to shoulder the responsibilities of parish ministry. And only total obedience to the bishop prevented him from running away two times. Imagine him considering himself as not worthy. What of the rest of us? The main thing the priest does is to offer the Eucharistic sacrifice. That's the highest and central ministry of the priest. Jesus Christ at the Last Supper, anticipating his sacrifice on the cross, on the following day, consecrated bread and wine into his body and blood, offered himself to his eternal Father, and ordered his apostles to do the same in remembrance of him at the Last Supper. The priest is Christ's minister and instrument in the offering of the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the sacramental representation of the sacrifice of the cross. What Christ did on the cross on Good Friday, 
the priest does at the altar in sacramental form bread and wine which become the body and blood of Christ and he offers to the eternal father and all the people of God with the priest and through the priest offer. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the Eucharistic sacrifice are one single sacrifice because as the Council of Trent teaches us, the council that gave most attention to the Holy Eucharist as doctrine that council says the sacrifice of the cross and that of the altar are the same sacrifice because the victim is one and the same. The same now offers through the ministry of priests who then offered himself on the cross. Only the manner of offering is different. So those who come to mass are like those who were on Mount Calvary. There is a difference. At the Mass, Christ does not suffer. He does not shed blood. At the Mass, Christ uses the ministry of the priest. Nevertheless, Christ is the chief priest on Calvary and at the altar. At Mass, the priest is at the height of his calling. There is nothing the priest does which is greater than celebrating the sacrifice of the Mass. But the priest also proclaims the word of God. Even the celebration of Mass has as the first part the word of God proclaimed and preached. The priest proclaims the word of God to the people. He catechizes them in the homily. He relates the word of God to the realities of life in the world of today. if the homily is a good one, based on sound theology and on the liturgical texts and on the teaching of the church, not theological acrobatics or sociological analysis or exhibition of the latest political comments from the newspapers. Certainly not. No priest in Auckland does that. The priest breaks for the people the bread of the word of God because the Holy Eucharist is word and sacrament. The celebration of the Holy Eucharist has two parts. Part one, the word. Part two, body and blood. The priest helps the people to realize that we have on earth no lasting city but seek one which is to come epistle to Hebrews. He guides the people therefore to understand who created them, why they exist, where they are going, and how they can get there. People on this earthly pilgrimage need a road map. It is the honor and responsibility of the priest to preach the gospel. And in preaching, he follows the instruction of St. Paul to his disciple Timothy. Preach the word be urgent in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. Be unfailing in patience and teaching. The priest, therefore, does not get worried about political correctness or whether his preaching will buy him popularity. Rather, he preaches the gospel without discount because he is aware of the duties of the watchman as God told the prophet Ezekiel, if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any of them, that man is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. That means if the priest does not instruct the people properly, and the people live bad lives and don't reach heaven, they will suffer, but so will he. The priest, after all, is a servant, not a master of the word of God. When the word of God is read, at the end we say, the word of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord, 
not the hypothesis of a professor, not the theory of a learned man who has read many books, but the word of the Lord. Those who refuse to accept this word of the Lord and to be guided by it will be condemned, not by the priest, but by the word of God which they have ignored. Preaching is so important and dear to the church that it is entrusted as a ministry only to deacons, priests, and bishops. Nobody else is allowed to preach in the church. During official functions, the highest being the sacrifice of the mass, only deacon, priest, and bishop. Of course, others teach catechism. If I didn't have a very good catechist when I was small, I may not have been standing before you today. But the official teaching in the name of the church is by deacon, priest, and bishop. The priest announces also that God is above. God is transcendent. God is superior. That's one aspect of the preaching that the, the people need it. Special emphasis today that God is transcendent. God created us. We owe God everything. Adoration, praise, thanksgiving, and the reparation, and asking for what we need. We owe all that to God. This is what religion is all about. You will remember those four acts. From the very word acts, A, adoration, C, contrition, T, thanksgiving, and S, supplication. That's what religion is about. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication, that is begging for what we need, coming last, not first. For many people, religion is asking God for what we need. They ask the priest to say mass when they need something. But not, which is good, but not when they want to thank God, when they want to praise God. You know, religion is God words, not, we are not the center. God is the center. It is the duty of the priest to announce that so that the people see that religion is actually necessary. It is actually normal. A person without religion is actually abnormal. And if the person doesn't know it, some friend should go quietly and inform that person. You are not normal. <laughs> a, a child, <coughs> a baby, a baby, a child that does not recognize father and mother and says, I don't care about papa and mama, that little brat should <laughs> have someone go and say, you are not normal. In that sense, religion is not optional. It is necessary. Because God created us, we are his creatures. We cannot argue that away. A human being who dares to deny God this practical recognition of his transcendence and providence, that means God is above all of us, and God arranges all the details of our life. If anyone dares to deny that, the person is not only dishonest, but also ridiculous. Because as the Second Vatican Council says, without the creator, the creature would disappear. It isn't that without God, we cannot do much. Without God, we would not be anything at all, not even a corpse. When God is for, forgotten, says the Second Vatican Council, when God is forgotten, the creature itself grows unintelligible. If we don't pay attention to God, we ourselves become unknown to ourselves. Secularism is that ideology which wants people to live and act as if God did not exist. 
Secularism is an error, mistaken in its thought form, poor when it is put under serious examination, disastrous when it is brought into public life or private life, secularism is one of the challenges in our time which the priest cannot ignore. Many people want us to live in the world as if God did not exist. But God does exist. As Pope Benedict XVI put it, when he was speaking to the Pontifical Council for Culture two years ago, he said, Secularism that presents itself in cultures as planning of the world and of humanity without reference to transcendence invades every aspect of daily life and develops a mentality in which God is in reality absent totally or in part from human existence or consciousness. A culture that is on the road to secularism is on the slippery slope. The priest, therefore, shows people how the will of God directs our lives, how the law of God, the plan of God written into human nature, expressed in the Ten Commandments, should guide our lives. When Pope John Paul II, Venerable, visited Mount Sinai in Egypt, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, Pope John Paul said, before God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, written them on stone, he already wrote them in the human heart. That's another way of saying the natural law is known by the human person. When that human person is not oppressed by uncontrolled passions or repressed by ideologies like communism or materialism or secularism, when the person is a normal human being, the person recognizes the essential part of the Ten Commandments. Be that person a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a follower of African traditional religion. Therefore, to bring the law of God into the family, the place of work and recreation, politics, oh yes, politics, school, trade and commerce, law and medicine, God, God's will enters all that because there is no area of human life outside divine providence. No part of our lives is outside divine law. That psalm, that longest of the psalms, Psalm 119, by some reckonings, 118, you can look at it later, you will find in its 176 verses, every verse has one word for the will of God. A different word like your ways, precepts, commandments, law, promises, statutes, justice, ordinances. That's the law of God in different ways expressed. It is the duty of the priest and also his joy and his honor. To share this with people. Lift up your hearts. The priest also gathers the people of God together. The church on earth is visible. It is the congregation of those who are baptized in Christ, professing the same faith, celebrating the same sacraments, and living the new life won for us by Christ, especially by serving one another, and in particular, the needy. The most visible form of the church is the parish. There is, of course, the, un the diocese, and there's the universal church. But basic down, where people live, the parish. The parish is a community of faith, worship, and service. We believe the same thing. We worship in the same way, especially Sunday Mass, but that's not enough. We also maintain Christian solidarity. That is, we are with the poor, the needy, the sick, the lonely, the old, the handicapped. This visible family of God on earth is shepherded by the bishop, who has his priests as his closest co-workers. 
the priest works in the unity of the diocesan presbyterium. That means the team of priests led by their bishop. Most priests are assigned to parish work, but some are called by the bishop to work with him in the diocesan office or at special assignments such as communications, media, chaplain to educational institutions, helping to chaplain lay apostolate organizations, working in the Roman Curia, and so on. Whatever form it takes, the priest is a shepherd under the leadership of the chief shepherd in the diocese, who is the bishop. The priest helps people to know where they are going in life, orientation in life. He has the honor and responsibility to help the people to be properly oriented. That is, when you are going to a place and you, you are in a hurry, the most important thing is to stop to make sure where you are going and to know how you can get there. Otherwise, hurrying, you may be going away from where you should be going. The priest awakens and educates consciences. He helps people to see their duties and responsibilities. Most people think of their rights, not so much of their duties. To young people, the priest recalls the importance of honesty, generosity, respect for their parents, chastity in preparing for a state of life. He reminds medical doctors that they are called to care for life, to promote life, not to terminate life, not to truncate it, not to kill it by abortion or euthanasia. To people in politics and in government, the priest underlines service, honesty, provision of the structures and services needed by the people, they need to be content with their pay. You just imagine, if every person in public life, in all countries, were content with their pay, wouldn't it be very nice? I'm not talking of New Zealand. I arrived here only two days ago. The priest reminds the rich of the universal destination of earthly goods. That is, the rich, whether individuals or states, are bound to remember the poor and to share with them. God did not want a few people to monopolize most of the goods of the earth. The experts tell us that 20% of humanity are enjoying 80% of their resources. And 80% of humanity are making do with the 20% that remains. That means God didn't want a minority of people to be engaging in the opulence and squandermania and become an oasis of enjoyment, while the majority of the people are deserts of misery and want. It is the priest who is to say this. If he does not say it, who will do it? Pope Benedict XVI, in his encyclical letter, Caritas in Veritate, stresses the role of solidarity. That means acceptance of interdependence and observance of an economic system which does not exclude the poor from the banquet of life. Solidarity means you accept that we depend on one another. I need you, you need me. The teacher needs the student. The student needs the teacher. The Governor, the, uh, the, the prime minister needs the citizens, and the citizens need the governor. Even the uh, president of a university needs a cobbler and needs a cook, and everybody is important. When we accept interdependence, and we don't just tolerate it, but we accept it and live it and share it, it becomes solidarity, which is another word for charity. We accept one another as brothers and sisters in the pilgrimage of life. So we share. Those who have a lot of goods, even if they acquired all that honestly, have a duty to share with those who have not much. Otherwise, they become like that person in the gospel, Divers, who gave nothing to Lazarus until after death. 
he suffered and Lazarus went to heaven. The priest also orients people in difficulty to see the meaning in life. Many people suffer in this world. Sometimes it's very difficult to explain why they are suffering. The priest should be near them to help them, to see meaning in life, to identify the way forward. For example, those who are terminally sick, the priest helps them to accept the will of God and prepare to meet their creator. The will of God may be what God wants directly, but it may also be what God permits. If, any, if a person comes and steals my car, God does not want the person to steal the car. But God permits, because if God were to stop the person, then God would deprive that person of free will, and nobody would be able to move. If a person wanted to steal, God would make it impossible to move. <laughs> well, you ask God to walk a miracle every day and take away our free will. That means to bring us to heaven by force. But God wants us to come to heaven freely. So, we must also learn to live with the unpleasant things which God permits. Like when somebody accuses me falsely, when somebody damages my name, the priest helps people, the amputated soldier who has to pass the rest of, the rest of his life with only one leg. To help that person to see meaning in life. The sick and the elderly, the priest gives them comfort and assurance that God has not forgotten them. The young widow whose husband died in an airplane crash. And the mother whose only son was shot dead by thieves. By mistake. The priest offers them some light in the tunnel. To the oppressed and repressed people, he announces Christ the true liberator. He also seeks ways to disarm the oppressors. To people addicted to alcohol, drugs, or sex, the priest preaches a gospel of liberation in Christ if they are willing to be pulled out of the mud. Because St. Augustine says, God who made you without your cooperation will not save you without your cooperation. To HIV AIDS patients, he offers solidarity and organizes anti-retroviral -retro drugs and service as much as in his power lies. Or at least, he asks those who can do it to do it. It is also the ministry of the priest to orient people to appreciate their dignity as members of the church and their dignity as members who have to carry out their mission. He helps them realize that the church is one of the objects of our faith as expressed in the credo. That means in the credo where we say what we believe. We believe not only in God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but also in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins. So the church then, divine elements, but also human elements. The divine elements will never fall short. The human element can fall short. And sometimes it happens. From the days of Judas Iscariot. But the divine element is constant. Because Christ gave his church divine guarantee. That I will be with you all days until the end of time. A greater insurance company you could not invent. So the priest helps people then to accept the actual church that exists with all its members, perfect and imperfect. Our faith is not in an imaginary church. In this church, everyone has an apostolate to carry out. The lay faithful, in particular, are reminded of their specific mission to evangelize the secular order from within. The secular order means the family, the place of work and recreation, politics and government, trade and commerce, science and technology. Evangelize them from within. That is the apostolate specific to lay people. The priest will keep on reminding them about this. The priest, moreover, awakens interest of the lay faithful in the evangelization of the whole world, since only one third of the world is Christian. Only one third. Catholics are 17.4%. All other Christians 
put together are about 15.6%. So all Christians are 33%. That includes the Christians who don't remember when they came to church last. And it includes those who engage in a la carte Christianity. I like this doctrine. Good. This other one, I don't like it. This commandment, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, all those are 33%. The priest has to help them to follow the real Christ, not their own imaginary Christ or a selective type. Not to talk of bringing the good news of the gospel to other people. And they are two-thirds of humanity. The priest also brings God's grace to the people, already by word of God and celebrating the sacraments. It's a great honor for the priest to be the instrument of God in bringing graces and blessings to the people. He does this principally by administering the sacraments, the chief means of dispensation of the graces of redemption. The priest baptizes, liberates people from the chain of sin in the sacrament of penance, anoints them when they are sick, he blesses their marriages. Above all, he celebrates for them the Eucharistic sacrifice and administers to them the body and blood of Christ. The priest's hands at ordination are anointed. The whole palm is anointed by the bishop. With these hands, the priest offers sacrifice to God. He imposes hands on people and prays for God's blessing on them. Let us note the words he pronounces when he blesses people. He does not say, may my blessing be on you. I know. The priest says, may the blessing of Almighty God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on you and remain with you always. It is the blessing of Almighty God. The priest is only God's instrument. Isn't that a wonderful vocation? The church has blessings in her ritual book for children, for expectant mothers, for mothers who are thanking God for their newborn baby, for the sick, and for objects such as houses, schools, offices, machines, cars, aeroplanes, printing machines, computers, farm instruments, radio, transmitting instruments, and so on. The priest is the usual minister of God and of the church for these various blessings, although a deacon can do some of them, and a bishop, of course. The priest also calls on God to bless people's efforts at reconciliation, justice, and peace. Such initiatives can be at the level of the family, but also national, regional, and international. We need the priest's mediator role and prayer for all such initiatives. When the people ask the priest to pray for them, they are correct. It is his work. He is intercessor of the people before God. He brings their adoration, praise, thanksgiving, reparation, and supplication to God. The priests, the people's suffering, their cries of anguish, their unexpressed groanings are brought before God by the priest. During a plague, when there is local or other catastrophe, or when an epidemic breaks out, the priest is there to bring the people's prayer to God. Moses is a model for the priest in this. As long as Moses kept his arms raised in prayer and intercession, so long did the people of Israel continue to win in the battlefield. Exodus chapter 17. Moses interceded for his people who were not always faithful to God and who even descended to the depth of adoring an idol, a golden calf. Often, people rightly ask the priest to pray for them. The sick, the lonely, the old, the widow, the orphan, the unemployed should occupy a place of honor in the priest's heart. So should the youth, the newly married, and all families in difficulty. And also, when people rejoice, when they are doing their jubilee of wedding, when they uh, get a, a new baby baptized, the priest shares their joy. And when they are burying the dead, he shares their sorrow. Joy shared is joy multiplied. Sorrow shared is sorrow divided. The liturgy of the hours or the prayer of the church for the different hours of the day, that is entrusted also to the priest to pray in the name of the whole church, for the church and for the world. It is very important, therefore, to have a priest in a Catholic community. 
from all we have discussed, this comes out clearly. As the Second Vatican Council says in its document on priests, no Christian community can be built up unless it has its basis and center in the celebration of the Most Holy Eucharist. And no Mass is possible without a priest. Therefore, every Catholic community absolutely needs the ministry of a priest. There is little love of God in that parish. You will be the one to put it there. That is what the bishop told St. John Mary Vianney when he was sending him to us as parish priest. And John Mary Vianney fulfilled this role magnificently. He says, leave a parish for 20 years without a priest and the people will end by worshipping beasts there. The priest is not a priest for himself, he is a priest for you, says the cure of us. That is why the church insists very much on the type of priest who will bring the love of God among people. The Second Vatican Council did this in two decrees, one on priestly formation and the other one on priestly life and ministry. I know because I was there. I was made bishop two weeks before the last session of Vatican II in 1965. And that's when most of the documents were concluded. I was signing documents on which I had not worked because they were pre being prepared along the three years earlier. But they are magnificent documents. The Synod of Bishops celebrated in 1990 and the post-synodal exhortation apostolic pastoral double verbis after that synod in 1992 by Pope John Paul II they dwell on the same theme on 19th June last year Pope Benedict inaugurated a year for priests with an apostolic letter to priests if I were speaking only to priests of course I would go into greater detail on the other the devil and the other enemies of the church and some of them work for the devil without realizing it, they know the importance of the priest for the life and mission of the church. And so they often attack priests and try to pour ridicule on them. If one priest is found to have given scandal somewhere, they suggest that that is the same for many other priests. On the other hand, those who love the church know that priests should be appreciated and supported and that priestly vocations have to be promoted. This is an affair of the whole church to pr promote priestly vocations. The fourth Sunday of Easter, Good Shepherd Sunday, is dedicated in a special way to pray for priestly vocations. Where a priest is not available for the celebration of Sunday Mass, a service of the word is held on a Sunday. But such a solution, says Pope John Paul II, quote, must be considered merely temporary while the community awaits a priest. The sacramental incompleteness of these celebrations should above all inspire the whole community to pray with greater fervor that the Lord will send laborers into his harvest. It should also be an incentive to mobilize all the resources needed for an adequate promotion of vocations. And that is now our final consideration. You have been very patient indeed. These reflections lead us to ask what we can do to show our support for our priests. We should begin by refreshing our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, the eternal High Priest. Every Catholic needs to be informed on the role of the priest in the church. This will lead all of us to look on the priest with the eyes of faith and to see him as a minister of Christ, as another Christ. Respect and love will arise out of such faith. Prayer for priests will follow. The desire to see the priest succeed will lead us to work with him, to offer him professional and other help, and to encourage him especially in moments of difficulty. Parents, by the respect they show to the priest, are teaching their children to do the same and never to join in attacking or vilifying the priest. 
You know the greatest help parents can give to the church in matter of priests? Let your son become a seminarian. Which means the parents have to be parents. Husband and wife have to be open to new life. If you have one child, perhaps he can become a priest. If you have five or six, perhaps it will be easier. Some will say, ah, well, you know, this bishop comes from an underdeveloped country. <laughs> he does not understand the pressures of modern life. Ah, yes, but this bishop understands that uh, a child is, is bigger than money, you know. The children sitting around your breakfast table are more precious than your bank account, which has digits all over the place. The child is greater than money. A child is better. A child is better than a cat and better than a dog and better than a car. A child, a child is better than color television because the child can smile. The child is a sign that the parents live on and that they consider life a good thing. So they hand it on to others. If you have several children, one boy goes to the seminary, the best one of course, and, and, and your best daughter goes to the convent. You can keep the others. The bishop will not complain that the seminary is overpopulated. I asked the bishop already whether the seminary has any more room for seminarians. He says there is room. Angels don't go to seminary. Seminarians must come from families. So if parents said there will be no more seminarians, then we, we are in trouble. So that's the best way to promote vocations. But of course, not everybody can do that. You can also pray. When I was Archbishop in Nigeria, I said to some rich people, now, your son didn't come to the seminary. Give us your money. <laughs> so with your money then, we can train the children of others who come. The greatest help, therefore, that parents can give towards promoting priestly vocations is to be willing to bring children into the world, to train them well, to support them when they desire to go to the seminary, and not when your child declares for seminary or your daughter declares for convent, the mother gets hypertension and the father has pneumonia. Seminaries and dioceses also welcome people who make financial donations to the seminary or who pay for individual seminarians. The Pontifical Society for Mission Clergy in the Vatican, which is original idea of lay people, not clerics, it coordinates work worldwide for the promotion of local clergy in countries of recent evangelization. If that society did not promote vocations in Nigeria, I might not be standing before you today. Now, I don't want to do like that preacher about whom someone said, he has finished, but he has not stopped. <laughs> you know the type of preaching that never ends. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the priesthood is a great gift of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to his church and to the world. By the intercession of the most blessed Virgin Mary, mother of priests, may all priests grow daily in love of God and neighbor, which flowers in pastoral zeal. And may all of us contribute as best we can to the flourishing of the priesthood, especially in this year of priest. To Christ, the eternal high priest, be honor and glory forever and ever. <laughs>